The Southern United States, also known as the American South, Dixie, Dixieland, or simply the South, is a region of the United States of America. It is located between the Atlantic Ocean and the western United States, with the Midwestern United States and Northeastern United States to its north and the Gulf of Mexico and Mexico to its south. The South does not fully match the geographic South of the United States but is commonly defined as including the states that fought for the Confederate States of America in the American Civil War. The Deep South is fully located in the southeastern corner. Arizona and New Mexico, which are geographically in the southern part of the country, are rarely considered part, while West Virginia, which separated from Virginia in 1863, commonly is. Some scholars have proposed definitions of the South that do not coincide neatly with state boundaries. While the states of Delaware and Maryland, as well as the District of Columbia, permitted slavery prior to the start of the Civil War, they remained with the Union. Since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, they became more culturally, economically, and politically aligned with the industrial northern states, and are often identified as part of the Mid-Atlantic or Northeast by many residents, businesses, public institutions, and private organizations, but the United States Census Bureau puts them in the South. Usually, the South is defined as including the southeastern and south-central United States. The region is known for its culture and history, having developed its own customs, musical styles, and cuisines, which have distinguished it in some ways from the rest of the United States. The southern ethnic heritage is diverse and includes strong European mostly English, Scottish, Scotch-Irish, Irish, German, French, and Spanish-American, African, and some Native American components. Some other aspects of the historical and cultural development of the South have been influenced by the institution of slave labor on plantations in the Deep South to an extent seen nowhere else in the United States, the presence of a large proportion of African Americans in the population, support for the doctrine of states' rights, and the legacy of racial tension magnified by the Civil War and Reconstruction era, as seen in thousands of lynchings mostly from 1880 to 1930, the segregated system of separate schools and public facilities known as Jim Crow laws that lasted until the 1960s, and the widespread use of poll taxes and other methods to frequently deny black people of the right to vote or hold office until the 1960s. Since the late 1960s, black people have held many offices in southern states, especially in the coastal states of Virginia and South Carolina. Many black people have also been elected or appointed as mayors and police chiefs in the metropolises of Charlotte, Birmingham, Richmond, Columbia, Memphis, Houston, Atlanta, Jacksonville, and New Orleans, and serve in both the U.S. Congress and state legislatures. Historically, the South relied heavily on agriculture, and was highly rural until after 1945. It has since become more industrialized and urban and has attracted national and international migrants. The American South is now among the fastest growing areas in the United States. Houston is the largest city in the southern United States. Sociological research indicates that southern collective identity stems from political, demographic, and cultural distinctiveness from the rest of the United States. The region contains almost all of the Bible Belt, an area of high Protestant church attendance especially evangelical churches such as the Southern Baptist Convention and predominantly conservative, religion-influenced politics. Indeed, studies have shown that Southerners are more conservative than non-Southerners in several areas, including religion, morality, international relations, and race relations. This is evident in both the region's religious attendance figures and in the region's usually strong support for the Republican Party in political elections since the 1960s, and especially since the 1990s. Apart from its climate, the living experience in the South increasingly resembles the rest of the nation. The arrival of millions of Northerners, especially in major metropolitan areas and coastal areas, and millions of Hispanics has meant the introduction of cultural values and social norms not rooted in Southern traditions. Observers conclude that collective identity and Southern distinctiveness are thus declining, particularly when defined against an earlier South that was somehow more authentic, real, more unified and distinct. The process has worked both ways, however, with aspects of Southern culture spreading throughout a greater portion of the rest of the United States in a process termed Southernization. Geography. <laughs> <laughs> The question of how to define the subregions in the South has been the focus of research for nearly a century. 
As defined by the United States Census Bureau, the southern region of the United States includes 16 states. As of 2010, an estimated 114,555,744 people, or 37% of all U.S. residents, lived in the South, the nation's most populous region. The Census Bureau defined three smaller divisions. The South Atlantic states, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia and West Virginia. The East-South Central states, Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi and Tennessee. The West-South Central states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas, the Council of State Governments, an organization for communication and coordination between states, includes in its South Regional Office the states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia. Other terms related to the South include the Old South, can mean either the slave states that existed in 1776 Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina or all the slave states before 1860 which included the newer states of Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. The New South, usually including the South Atlantic states. The Solid South, region largely controlled by the Democratic Party from 1877 to 1964, especially after disfranchisement of most blacks at the turn of the 20th century. Before that, blacks were elected to national office and many to local office through the 1880s. Populist Republican coalitions gained victories for fusionist candidates for governors in the 1890s. Includes at least all the 11 former Confederate states. Southern Appalachia, mainly refers to areas situated in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, namely Eastern Kentucky, East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Western Maryland, West Virginia, Southwest Virginia, North Georgia, and Northwestern South Carolina. Southeastern United States, usually including the Carolinas, the Virginias, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. The Deep South, various definitions, usually including Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and South Carolina. Also, parts of adjoining states are included sections of East Texas, the Mississippi embayment areas of Arkansas and Tennessee, and northern and central Florida. The Gulf South, various definitions, usually including Gulf coasts of Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas and Alabama. The Upper South, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and on rare occasions Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. Dixie, various definitions, but most commonly associated with the eleven states of the Old Confederacy. The Mid-South, various definitions, including that of the Census Bureau of the East and West-South Central United States, in another informal definition, Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, and sometimes adjoining areas of other states. Border South, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware were states on the outer rim of the Confederacy that did not secede from the United States in the 1860s, but did have significant numbers of residents who joined the Confederate armed forces. Kentucky and Missouri had Confederate governments in exile and were represented in the Confederate Congress and by stars on the Confederate battle flag. West Virginia formed in 1863 after the western region of Virginia broke away to protest the Old Dominion's joining of the Confederacy, but residents of the new state were about evenly divided on supporting the Union or the Confederacy. The popular definition of the South is more informal and generally associated with the eleven states that seceded before or during the Civil War to form the Confederate States of America. In order of their secession, these were, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. These states share commonalities of history and culture that carry on to the present day. Oklahoma was not a state during the Civil War, but all its major Native American tribes signed formal treaties of alliance with the Confederacy. The South is a diverse meteorological region with numerous climatic zones, including temperate, subtropical, tropical, and arid though the South generally has a reputation as hot and humid, with long summers and short, mild winters. Most of the South except for the higher elevations and areas near the western, southern, and some northern fringes fall in the humid subtropical climate zone. Crops grow readily in the south, its climate consistently provides growing seasons of at least six months before the first frost. 
Another common environment occurs in the bayous and swamplands of the Gulf Coast, especially in Louisiana and in Texas. History Native American culture The first well-dated evidence of human occupation in the South United States occurs around 9500 BC with the appearance of the earliest documented Americans, who are now referred to as Paleo-Indians. Paleo-Indians were hunter-gatherers that roamed in bands and frequently hunted megafauna. Several cultural stages, such as Archaic ca. 8000-1000 BC and the Woodland ca. 1000 BC, AD 1000, preceded what the Europeans found at the end of the 15th century. The Mississippian culture. The Mississippian culture was a complex, mound building Native American culture that flourished in what is now the southeastern United States from approximately 800 AD to 1500 AD. Natives had elaborate and lengthy trading routes connecting their main residential and ceremonial centers extending through the river valleys and from the east coast to the Great Lakes. Some noted explorers who encountered and described the Mississippian culture, by then in decline, included Panfilo de Narvaez Hernando de Soto and Pierre Le Moyne d'Iberville Native American descendants of the Mound Builders include Alabama, Appalachie, Caddo, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, Guale, Hitchiti, Homa, and Seminole peoples, all of whom still reside in the South. Other peoples whose ancestral links to the Mississippian culture are less clear but were clearly in the region before the European incursion include the Catawba and the Powhatan. Topic European colonization European immigration resulted in a corresponding die-off of Native Americans who had not been exposed to various diseases. The predominant culture of the South was rooted in the settlement of the region by British colonists. In the 17th century, most voluntary immigrants were of English origins who settled chiefly along the coastal regions of the eastern seaboard but had pushed as far inland as the Appalachian Mountains by the 18th century. The majority of early English settlers were indentured servants, who gained freedom after enough work to pay off their passage. The wealthier men who paid their way received land grants known as headrights. To encourage settlement, the Spanish and French established settlements in Florida, Texas, and Louisiana. The Spanish settled Florida in the 16th century, reaching a peak in the late 17th century. In the British colonies, immigration began in 1607 and continued until the outbreak of the Revolution in 1775. Settlers cleared land, built houses and outbuildings, and on their own farms. The rich owned large plantations that dominated export agriculture and used slaves. Many were involved in the labor-intensive cultivation of tobacco, the first cash crop of Virginia. Tobacco exhausted the soil quickly, requiring that farmers regularly clear new fields. They used old fields as pasture, and for crops such as corn and wheat, or allowed them to grow into woodlots. In the mid to late 18th century, large groups of Ulster Scots later called the Scotch-Irish and people from the Anglo-Scottish border region immigrated and settled in the back country of Appalachia and the Piedmont. They were the largest group of non-English immigrants from the British Isles before the American Revolution. In the 1980 census, 34% of Southerners reported that they were of English ancestry. English was the largest reported European ancestry in every Southern state by a large margin. The early colonists engaged in warfare, trade, and cultural exchanges. Those living in the backcountry were more likely to encounter Creek Indians, Cherokee, and Choctaws and other regional native groups. The oldest university in the South, the College of William and Mary, was founded in 1693 in Virginia. It pioneered in the teaching of political economy and educated future U.S. Presidents Jefferson, Monroe and Tyler, all from Virginia. Indeed, the entire region dominated politics in the first party system era, for example, four of the first five presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, were from Virginia. The two oldest public universities are also in the South, the University of North Carolina and the University of Georgia Topic American Revolution With Virginia in the lead, the Southern colonies embraced the American Revolution, providing such leaders as Commander-in-Chief George Washington, and the author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. In 1780 and 1781, the British largely halted reconquest of the northern states, and concentrated on the south, where they were told there was a large loyalist population ready to leap to arms once the royal forces arrived. 
The British took control of Savannah and Charleston, capturing a large American army in the process, and set up a network of bases inland. There were many more Loyalists in the South than in the North, but they were concentrated in larger coastal cities and were not great enough in number to overcome the revolutionaries. Large numbers of Loyalists from South Carolina fought for the British in the Battle of Camden. The British forces at the Battle of Monk's Corner and the Battle of Lenud's Ferry consisted entirely of Loyalists with the exception of the commanding officer Banistray Tarleton. Both white and black Loyalists fought for the British at the Battle of Kemp's Landing in Virginia, led by Nathaniel Green and other generals. The Americans engaged in Fabian tactics designed to wear down the British invasion force, and to neutralize its strong points one by one. There were numerous battles large and small, with each side claiming some victories. By 1781, however, British General Cornwallis moved north to Virginia, where an approaching army forced him to fortify and await rescue by the British Navy. The British Navy did arrive, but so did a stronger French fleet, and Cornwallis was trapped. American and French armies, led by Washington, forced Cornwallis to surrender his entire army in Yorktown, Virginia in October 1781, effectively winning the North American part of the war. The Revolution provided a shock to slavery in the South. Thousands of slaves took advantage of wartime disruption to find their own freedom, catalyzed by the British Governor Dunmore of Virginia's promise of freedom for service. Many others were removed by Loyalist owners and became slaves elsewhere in the empire. Between 1770 and 1790, there was a sharp decline in the percentage of blacks, from 61% to 44% in South Carolina and from 45% to 36% in Georgia. In addition, some slaveholders were inspired to free their slaves after the Revolution. They were moved by the principles of the Revolution, and Quaker and Methodist preachers worked to encourage slaveholders to free their slaves. Planters such as George Washington often freed slaves by their wills. In the Upper South, more than 10% of all blacks were free by 1810, a significant expansion from pre-war proportions of less than 1% free. Topic. Antebellum years Cotton became dominant in the Lower South after 1800. After the invention of the cotton gin, short staple cotton could be grown more widely. This led to an explosion of cotton cultivation, especially in the frontier uplands of Georgia, Alabama and other parts of the Deep South, as well as riverfront areas of the Mississippi Delta. Migrants poured into those areas in the early decades of the 19th century, when county population figures rose and fell as swells of people kept moving west. The expansion of cotton cultivation required more slave labor, and the institution became even more deeply an integral part of the South's economy, with the opening up of frontier lands after the government forced most Native Americans to move west of the Mississippi, there was a major migration of both whites and blacks to those territories. From the 1820s through the 1850s, more than one million enslaved Africans were transported to the Deep South in forced migration, two-thirds of them by slave traders and the others by masters who moved there. Planters in the Upper South sold slaves excess to their needs as they shifted from tobacco to mixed agriculture. Many enslaved families were broken up, as planters preferred mostly strong males for field work. Two major political issues that festered in the first half of the 19th century caused political alignment along sectional lines, strengthened the identities of North and South as distinct regions with certain strongly opposed interests, and fed the arguments over states' rights that culminated in secession and the Civil War. One of these issues concerned the protective tariffs enacted to assist the growth of the manufacturing sector, primarily in the North. In 1832, in resistance to federal legislation increasing tariffs, South Carolina passed an Ordinance of Nullification, a procedure in which a state would, in effect, repeal a federal law. Soon a naval flotilla was sent to Charleston Harbor, and the threat of landing ground troops was used to compel the collection of tariffs. A compromise was reached by which the tariffs would be gradually reduced, but the underlying argument over states' rights continued to escalate in the following decades. The second issue concerned slavery, primarily the question of whether slavery would be permitted in newly admitted states. The issue was initially finessed by political compromises designed to balance the number of free and slave states. The issue resurfaced in more virulent form, however, around the time of the Mexican-American War, which raised the stakes by adding new territories primarily on the southern side of the imaginary geographic divide. Congress opposed allowing slavery in these territories. 
Before the Civil War, the number of immigrants arriving at southern ports began to increase, although the North continued to receive the most immigrants. Huguenots were among the first settlers in Charleston, along with the largest number of Orthodox Jews outside of New York City. Numerous Irish immigrants settled in New Orleans, establishing a distinct ethnic enclave now known as the Irish Channel. Germans also went to New Orleans and its environs, resulting in a large area north of the city along the Mississippi becoming known as the German coast. Still greater numbers immigrated to Texas especially after 1848, where many bought land and were farmers. Many more German immigrants arrived in Texas after the Civil War, where they created the brewing industry in Houston and elsewhere, became grocers in numerous cities, and also established wide areas of farming. By 1840, New Orleans was the wealthiest city in the country and the third largest in population. The success of the city was based on the growth of international trade associated with products being shipped to and from the interior of the country down the Mississippi River. New Orleans also had the largest slave market in the country, as traders brought slaves by ship and overland to sell to planters across the Deep South. The city was a cosmopolitan port with a variety of jobs that attracted more immigrants than other areas of the South. Because of lack of investment, however, construction of railroads to span the region lagged behind the North. People relied most heavily on river traffic for getting their crops to market and for transportation. Topic. Civil War By 1856, the South had lost control of Congress, and was no longer able to silence calls for an end to slavery—which came mostly from the more populated, free states of the North. The Republican Party, founded in 1854, pledged to stop the spread of slavery beyond those states where it already existed. After Abraham Lincoln was elected the first Republican president in 1860, seven cotton states declared their secession and formed the Confederate States of America before Lincoln was inaugurated. The United States government, both outgoing and incoming, refused to recognize the Confederacy, and when the new Confederate president Jefferson Davis ordered his troops to open fire on Fort Sumter in April 1861, there was an overwhelming demand, north and south, for war. Only the state of Kentucky attempted to remain neutral, and it could only do so briefly. When Lincoln called for troops to suppress what he referred to as "...combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary," judicial or martial means, four more states decided to secede and join the Confederacy which then moved its capital to Richmond, Virginia. Although the Confederacy had large supplies of captured munitions and many volunteers, it was slower than the Union in dealing with the border states. By March 1862, the Union largely controlled Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky and Missouri, had shut down all commercial traffic from all Confederate ports, had prevented European recognition of the Confederate government, and was poised to seize New Orleans. In the four years of war 1861-65 the South was the primary battleground, with all but two of the major battles taking place on southern soil. Union forces relentlessly squeezed the Confederacy, controlling the border states in 1861, the Tennessee River, the Cumberland River and New Orleans in 1862, and the Mississippi River in 1863. In the East, however, the Confederate Army under Robert E. Lee beat off attack after attack in its defense of their capital at Richmond. But when Lee tried to move north, he was repulsed and nearly captured at Sharpsburg 1862 and Gettysburg 1863. The Confederacy had the resources for a short war, but was unable to finance or supply a longer war. It reversed the traditional low-tariff policy of the South by imposing a new 15% tax on all imports from the Union. The Union blockade stopped most commerce from entering the South, and smugglers avoided the tax, so the Confederate tariff produced too little revenue to finance the war. Inflated currency was the solution, but that created distrust of the Richmond government. Because of low investment in railroads, the southern transportation system depended primarily on river and coastal traffic by boat, both were shut down by the Union Navy. The small railroad system virtually collapsed, so that by 1864 internal travel was so difficult that the Confederate economy was crippled. The Confederate cause was hopeless by the time Atlanta fell and William T. Sherman marched through Georgia in late 1864, but the rebels fought on, refusing to give up their independence until Lee's army surrendered in April 1865. All the Confederate forces surrendered, and the region moved into the Reconstruction era. 
The South suffered much more than the North overall, as the Union strategy of attrition warfare meant that Lee could not replace his casualties, and the total war waged by Sherman, Sheridan and other Union armies devastated the infrastructure and caused widespread poverty and distress. The Confederacy suffered military losses of 95,000 men killed in action and 165,000 who died of disease, for a total of 260,000, out of a total white Southern population at the time of around 5.5 million. Based on 1860 census figures, 8% of all white males aged 13 to 43 died in the war, including 6% in the North and about 18% in the South. Northern military casualties exceeded southern casualties in absolute numbers, but were two-thirds smaller in terms of proportion of the population affected. Reconstruction and Jim Crow After the Civil War, the South was devastated in terms of population, infrastructure and economy. Because of states' reluctance to grant voting rights to freedmen, Congress instituted Reconstruction governments. It established military districts and governors to rule over the South until new governments could be established. Many white Southerners who had actively supported the Confederacy were temporarily disenfranchised. Rebuilding was difficult as people grappled with the effects of a new labor economy of a free market in the midst of a widespread agricultural depression. In addition, what limited infrastructure the South had was mostly destroyed by the war. At the same time, the North was rapidly industrializing. To avoid the social effects of the war, most of the southern states initially passed black codes. Eventually, these were mostly legally nullified by federal law and anti Confederate legislatures, which existed for a short time during Reconstruction. There were thousands of people on the move, as African Americans tried to reunite families separated by slave sales, and sometimes migrated for better opportunities in towns or other states. Other freed people moved from plantation areas to cities or towns for a chance to get different jobs. At the same time, whites returned from refuges to reclaim plantations or town dwellings. In some areas, many whites returned to the land to farm for a while. Some freed people left the South altogether for states such as Ohio and Indiana, and later, Kansas. Thousands of others joined the migration to new opportunities in the Mississippi and Arkansas Delta bottomlands and Texas. With passage of the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States which outlawed slavery, the Fourteenth Amendment which granted full U.S. citizenship to African Americans and the Fifteenth Amendment which extended the right to vote to African American males, African Americans in the South were made free citizens and were given the right to vote. Under federal protection, white and black Republicans formed constitutional conventions and state governments. Among their accomplishments were creating the first public education systems in southern states, and providing for welfare through orphanages, hospitals and similar institutions. Northerners came south to participate in politics and business. Some were representatives of the Freedmen's Bureau and other agencies of reconstruction, some were humanitarians with the intent to help black people. Some were adventurers who hoped to benefit themselves by questionable methods. They were all condemned with the pejorative term of carpetbagger. Some Southerners also took advantage of the disrupted environment and made money off various schemes, including bonds and financing for railroads, secret vigilante organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan—an organization sworn to perpetuate white supremacy—had arisen quickly after the war's end and used lynching, physical attacks, house burnings and other forms of intimidation to keep African Americans from exercising their political rights. Although the first Klan was disrupted by prosecution by the federal government in the early 1870s, other groups persisted. By the mid to late 1870s, elite Southerners created increasing resistance to the altered social structure. Paramilitary organizations such as the White League in Louisiana 1874, the Red Shirts in Mississippi 1875, and Rifle Clubs, all white line. Organizations, used organized violence against Republicans, both black and white, to remove Republicans from political office, repress and bar black voting, and restore the Democratic Party to power. In 1876 white Democrats regained power in most of the state legislatures. They began to pass laws designed to strip African Americans and poor whites from the voter registration rolls. The success of late 19th century interracial coalitions in several states inspired a reaction among some white Democrats, who worked harder to prevent both groups from voting. Despite discrimination, many blacks became property owners in areas that were still developing. 
For instance, 90% of the Mississippi's bottomlands were still frontier and undeveloped after the war. By the end of the century, two-thirds of the farmers in Mississippi's Delta bottomlands were black. They had cleared the land themselves and often made money in early years by selling off timber. Tens of thousands of migrants went to the Delta, both to work as laborers to clear timber for lumber companies, and many to develop their own farms. Nonetheless, the long agricultural depression, along with disenfranchisement and lack of access to credit, led to many blacks in the Delta losing their property by 1910 and becoming sharecroppers or landless workers over the following decade. More than two generations of free African Americans lost their stake in property. Nearly all Southerners, black and white, suffered as a result of the Civil War. Within a few years cotton production and harvest was back to pre-war levels, but low prices through much of the 19th century hampered recovery. They encouraged immigration by Chinese and Italian laborers into the Mississippi Delta. While the first Chinese entered as indentured laborers from Cuba, the majority came in the early 20th century. Neither group stayed long at rural farm labor. The Chinese became merchants and established stores in small towns throughout the Delta, establishing a place between white and black. Migrations continued in the late 19th and early 20th centuries among both blacks and whites. In the last two decades of the 19th century, about 141,000 blacks left the South, and more after 1900, totaling a loss of 537,000. After that the movement increased in what became known as the Great Migration from 1910 to 1940, and the Second Great Migration through 1970. Even more whites left the South, some going to California for opportunities and others heading to northern industrial cities after 1900. Between 1880 and 1910, the loss of whites totaled 1,243,000. Five million more left between 1940 and 1970. From 1890 to 1908, 10 of the 11 former Confederate states, along with Oklahoma upon statehood, passed disfranchising constitutions or amendments that introduced voter registration barriers—such as poll taxes, residency requirements and literacy tests—that were hard for many poor to meet. Most African Americans, most Mexican Americans, and tens of thousands of poor whites were disfranchised, losing the vote for decades. In some states, grandfather clauses temporarily exempted white illiterates from literacy tests. The numbers of voters dropped drastically throughout the former Confederacy as a result. This can be seen via the feature, Turnout in Presidential and Midterm Elections. At the University of Texas's politics, barriers to voting. Alabama, which had established universal white suffrage in 1819 when it became a state, also substantially reduced voting by poor whites. Democrat controlled legislatures passed Jim Crow laws to segregate public facilities and services, including transportation. While African Americans, poor whites, and civil rights groups started litigation against such provisions in the early 20th century, for decades Supreme Court decisions overturning such provisions were rapidly followed by new state laws with new devices to restrict voting. Most blacks in the former Confederacy and Oklahoma could not vote until 1965, after passage of the Voting Rights Act and federal enforcement to ensure people could register. Despite increases in the eligible voting population with the inclusion of women, blacks, and those 18 and over throughout this period, turnout in ex-Confederate states remained below the national average throughout the 20th century. Not until the late 1960s did all American citizens regain protected civil rights by passage of legislation following the leadership of the American Civil Rights Movement. Topic. Late 19th and 20th century Industrialization and Great Migration At the end of the 19th century, white Democrats in the South had created state constitutions that were hostile to industry and business development, with anti-industrial laws extensive from the time new constitutions were adopted in the 1890s. Banking was limited, as was access to credit. States persisted in agricultural economies. Especially in Alabama and Florida, rural minorities held control in many state legislatures long after population had shifted to industrializing cities, and legislators resisted business and modernizing interests. Alabama refused to redistrict between 1901 and 1972, long after major population and economic shifts to cities. 
For decades Birmingham generated the majority of revenue for the state, for instance, but received little back in services or infrastructure. In the late 19th century, Texas rapidly expanded its railroad network, creating a network of cities connected on a radial plan and linked to the port of Galveston. It was the first state in which urban and economic development proceeded independently of rivers, the primary transportation network of the past. A reflection of increasing industry were strikes and labor unrest. In 1885 Texas ranked ninth among 40 states in number of workers involved in strikes 4, 000, for the six-year period it ranked 15th. Seventy-five of the 100 strikes, chiefly interstate strikes of telegraphers and railway workers, occurred in the year 1886. By 1890 Dallas became the largest city in Texas, and by 1900 it had a population of more than 42,000, which more than doubled to over 92,000 a decade later. Dallas was the harness-making capital of the world and a center of other manufacturing. As an example of its ambitions, in 1907 Dallas built the Praetorian Building, 15 stories tall and the first skyscraper west of the Mississippi, soon to be followed by other skyscrapers. Texas was transformed by a railroad network linking five important cities, among them Houston with its nearby port at Galveston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and El Paso. Each exceeded 50,000 in population by 1920, with the major cities having three times that population. Business interests were ignored by the Southern Democrat ruling class. Nonetheless, major new industries started developing in cities such as Atlanta, Georgia, Birmingham, Alabama, and Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston, Texas. Growth began occurring at a geometric rate. Birmingham became a major steel producer and mining town, with major population growth in the early decades of the 20th century. The first major oil well in the south was drilled at Spindletop near Beaumont, Texas, on the morning of January 10, 1901. Other oil fields were later discovered nearby in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and under the Gulf of Mexico. The resulting oil boom permanently transformed the economy of the west-south central states and produced the most significant economic expansion after the Civil War. In the early 20th century, invasion of the boll weevil devastated cotton crops in the south, producing an additional catalyst to African Americans' decisions to leave the south. From 1910 to 1940, and then from the 1940s to 1970, more than 6.5 million African Americans left the South in the Great Migration to northern and midwestern cities, defecting from persistent lynching, violence, segregation, poor education, and inability to vote. Black migration transformed many northern cities, creating new cultures and music. Many African Americans, like other groups, became industrial workers, others started their own businesses within the communities. Southern whites also migrated to industrial cities, especially Chicago and Detroit, where they took jobs in the booming new auto industry. Later, the Southern economy was dealt additional blows by the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. After the Wall Street crash of 1929, the economy suffered significant reversals and millions were left unemployed. Beginning in 1934 and lasting until 1939, an ecological disaster of severe wind and drought caused an exodus from Texas and Arkansas, the Oklahoma Panhandle region, and the surrounding plains, in which over 500,000 Americans were homeless, hungry and jobless. Thousands left the region forever to seek economic opportunities along the West Coast. President Franklin D. Roosevelt noted the South as the number one priority in terms of need of assistance during the Great Depression. His administration created programs such as the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1933 to provide rural electrification and stimulate development. Locked into low-productivity agriculture, the region's growth was slowed by limited industrial development, low levels of entrepreneurship, and the lack of capital investment. World War II marked a time of change in the South as new industries and military bases were developed by the federal government, providing badly needed capital and infrastructure in many regions. People from all parts of the U.S. came to the South for military training and work in the region's many bases and new industries. Farming shifted from cotton and tobacco to include soybeans, corn, and other foods. Industrial growth increased in the 1960s and greatly accelerated into the 1980s and 1990s. Several large urban areas in Texas, Georgia, and Florida grew to over 4 million people. 
Rapid expansion in industries such as autos, telecommunications, textiles, technology, banking, and aviation gave some states in the South an industrial strength to rival large states elsewhere in the country. By the 2000 census, the South along with the West was leading the nation in population growth. With this growth, however, has come long commute times and air pollution problems in cities such as Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, Austin, Charlotte, and others that rely on sprawling development and highway networks. <laughs> Modern economy In the late 20th century, the South changed dramatically. It saw a boom in its service economy, manufacturing base, high technology industries, and the financial sector. Texas in particular witnessed dramatic growth and population change with the dominance of the energy industry and tourism such as the Alamo Mission in San Antonio. Tourism in Florida and along the Gulf Coast also grew steadily throughout the last decades of the 20th century. Numerous new automobile production plants have opened in the region, or are soon to open, such as Mercedes-Benz in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Hyundai in Montgomery, Alabama, the BMW production plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina, Toyota plants in Georgetown, Kentucky, Blue Springs, Mississippi and San Antonio, the GM manufacturing plant in Spring Hill, Tennessee, a Honda factory in Lincoln, Alabama, the Nissan North American headquarters in Franklin, Tennessee and factories in Smyrna, Tennessee and Canton, Mississippi, a Kia factory in West Point, Georgia, and the Volkswagen Chattanooga Assembly Plant in Tennessee. The two largest research parks in the country are located in the South, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina the world's largest and the Cummings Research Park in Huntsville, Alabama the world's fourth largest. In medicine, the Texas Medical Center in Houston has achieved international recognition in education, research, and patient care, especially in the fields of heart disease, cancer, and rehabilitation. In 1994 the Texas Medical Center was the largest medical center in the world including 14 hospitals, two medical schools, four colleges of nursing, and six university systems. The University of Texas MD. Anderson Cancer Center is consistently ranked the number one cancer research and treatment center in the United States. Many major banking corporations have headquarters in the region. Bank of America is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Wachovia was headquartered there before its purchase by Wells Fargo. Regions Financial Corporation is in Birmingham, as is AmSouth Bank Corporation, and BBVA Compass. SunTrust Banks is located in Atlanta, as is the district headquarters of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. BB&T is headquartered in Winston-Salem. Many corporations are headquartered in Atlanta and its surrounding area, such as the Coca-Cola Company, Delta Air Lines, and the Home Depot, and also to many cable television networks, such as the Turner Broadcasting System CNN, TBS, TNT, Turner South, Cartoon Network, and the Weather Channel. In recent years some southern states, most notably Texas, have lured companies with lower tax burdens and lower cost of living for their workforce. Today, the states with the most Fortune 500 companies include California, New York, and Texas, closely mirroring the economic and population resources of those states. This economic expansion has enabled parts of the South to report some of the lowest unemployment rates in the United States. But in the U.S. top 10 of poorest big cities, the South is represented in the rankings by two cities, Miami, Florida and Memphis, Tennessee. In 2011, nine out of ten poorest states were in the South. Topic education Southern public schools in the past ranked in the lower half of some national surveys. When allowance for race is considered, a 2007 U.S. government list of test scores often shows white 4th and 8th graders performing better than average for reading and math, while black 4th and 8th graders also performed better than average. This comparison does not hold across the board. Mississippi scores lower than average no matter how the statistics are compared. Newer data suggests that education in the South is on par with the nation, with 72% of high schoolers graduating compared to 73% nationwide. Topic culture Several southern states Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia were British colonies that sent delegates to sign the Declaration of Independence and then fought against the government along with the northern colonies during the Revolutionary War. The basis for much Southern culture derives from the pride in these states being among the 13 original colonies, and from the fact that much of the population of the South has strong ancestral links to colonists who emigrated West. 
Southern manners and customs reflect the relationship with England and Africa that was held by the early population, with some influences being provided by the Native American populations of the area. Overall, the South has had lower percentages of high school graduates, lower housing values, lower household incomes, and lower cost of living than the rest of the United States. These factors, combined with the fact that Southerners have continued to maintain strong loyalty to family ties, has led some sociologists to label white Southerners an ethnic or quasi-ethnic group, though this interpretation has been subject to criticism on the grounds that proponents of the view do not satisfactorily indicate how Southerners meet the criteria of ethnicity. The predominant culture of the South has its origins with the settlement of the region by large groups of Northern English, Scots Lowlanders and Ulster Scots later called the Scotch-Irish who settled in Appalachia. Appalachia and the Piedmont in the 18th century, and from parts of southern England such as East Anglia, Kent and the West Country in the 17th century, and the many African slaves who were part of the southern economy. African American descendants of the slaves brought into the South compose the United States' second largest racial minority, accounting for 12.1% of the total population according to the 2000 census. Despite Jim Crow era outflow to the north, the majority of the black population remains concentrated in the southern states, and has heavily contributed to the cultural blend Christianity, foods, art, music see spiritual, blues, jazz and rock and roll that characterize southern culture today. In previous censuses, the largest ancestry group identified by Southerners was English or mostly English, with 19,618,370 self-reporting English as an ancestry on the 1980 census, followed by 12,709,872 listing Irish and 11,054,127 Afro-American. Almost a third of all Americans who claim English ancestry can be found in the American South, and over a quarter of all Southerners claim English descent as well. The South also continues to have the highest percentage of African Americans in the country, due to the history of slavery. Topic. Religion The South has had a majority of its population adhering to evangelical Protestantism ever since the Second Great Awakening, although the upper classes often stayed Anglican, Episcopalian or Presbyterian. The First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening from about 1742 about 1850 generated large numbers of Methodists and Baptists, which remain the two main Christian confessions in the South. By 1900, the Southern Baptist Convention had become the largest Protestant denomination in the whole United States with its membership concentrated in rural areas of the South. Baptists are the most common religious group, followed by Methodists, Pentecostals and other denominations. Roman Catholics historically were concentrated in Maryland, Louisiana, and Hispanic areas such as South Texas and South Florida and along the Gulf Coast. The great majority of black Southerners are either Baptist or Methodist. Statistics show that southern states have the highest religious attendance figures of any region in the United States, constituting the so-called Bible Belt. Pentecostalism has been strong across the South since the late 19th century. Topic: Sports. Topic: American football. American football, especially at the college and high school level, is by far the most popular team sport in most areas of the southern United States. The region is home to numerous decorated and historic college football programs, particularly in the Southeastern Conference known as the SEC, Atlantic Coast Conference known as the ACC, and the Big 12 Conference. The SEC, consisting entirely of teams based in southern states, is widely considered to be the strongest league in contemporary college football and includes the Alabama Crimson Tide, the program with the most national championships in the sport's history. The sport is also highly competitive and has a spectator following at the high school level, particularly in rural areas where high school football games often serve as prominent community gatherings. Though not as popular on a wider basis as the collegiate game, professional football also has a growing tradition in the southern United States. Before league expansion began in the 1960s, the only established professional team based in the South was the Washington Redskins, who still retain a large following in many pockets of the region. 
Later on, the merger era National Football League began to expand into the football craze deep south in the 1960s with franchises like the Atlanta Falcons, New Orleans Saints, Houston Oilers, Miami Dolphins, and most prominently the Dallas Cowboys, who overtook Washington as the region's most popular team and eventually became widely considered the most popular team in the United States. In later decades, NFL expansion into southern states continued, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Jacksonville Jaguars, and Carolina Panthers added to the league, while the Houston Oilers were replaced by the Houston Texans after the Oilers relocated to Nashville to become the Tennessee Titans. Baseball <inaudible> 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 Baseball has been played in the southern United States since at least the years leading up to the American Civil War. It was traditionally more popular than American football until the 1980s, and still accounts for the largest annual attendance amongst sports played in the South. The first mention of a baseball team in Houston was on April 11, 1861. 19th century and early 20th century games were common, especially once the professional leagues such as the Texas League, the Dixie League, and the Southern League were organized. The short-lived Louisville Colonels were a part of the early National League and American Association, but ceased to exist in 1899. The first Southern Major League Baseball team after the Colonels appeared in 1962 when the Houston Colt, 45s known today as the Houston Astros were enfranchised. Later, the Atlanta Braves came in 1966, followed by the Texas Rangers in 1972, and finally the Miami Marlins and Tampa Bay Rays in the 1990s. College baseball appears to be more well attended in the southern U.S. than elsewhere, as teams like Florida State, Arkansas, LSU, Virginia, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, South Carolina, and Texas are commonly at the top of the NCAA's attendance. The South generally produces very successful collegiate baseball teams as well, with Virginia, Vanderbilt, LSU, and South Carolina winning recent College World Series titles. The following is a list of best-attended baseball teams in the southern U.S. Auto racing The southern states are commonly associated with stock car racing and its most prominent competition NASCAR, which is based in Charlotte, North Carolina. The sport was developed in the Deep South in the early 20th century, with stock car racing's historic mecca being Daytona Beach, Florida, where cars initially raced on the wide, flat beachfront before the construction of Daytona International Speedway. Though the sport has attained a following throughout the United States, a majority of NASCAR races continue to take place at southern tracks. Basketball Basketball is very popular throughout the southern United States as both a recreational and spectator sport, particularly in the states of North Carolina and Kentucky which are home to several historically prominent college basketball programs. Prominent NBA teams based in the South include the San Antonio Spurs, Houston Rockets, Oklahoma City Thunder, Dallas Mavericks, Washington Wizards, Charlotte Hornets, Atlanta Hawks, Orlando Magic, Memphis Grizzlies, New Orleans Pelicans, and the Miami Heat. Topic. Golf Golf is a popular recreational sport in most areas of the South, with the region's warm climate allowing it to host many professional tournaments and numerous destination golf resorts, particularly in the state of Florida. The region is home to the Masters, an elite invitational competition played at Augusta National Golf Club in Augusta, Georgia, which has become one of the professional game's most important tournaments. Topic. Soccer. In recent decades association football, known in the South as in the rest of the United States as soccer, has become a popular sport at youth and collegiate levels throughout the region. The game has been historically widespread at the college level in the Atlantic Coast states of Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, which contain many of the nation's most successful college soccer programs. The establishment of Major League Soccer has led to professional soccer clubs in the southern cities including FC Dallas, Houston Dynamo, San Antonio FC, Orlando City, and Atlanta United. The current United States Third Division Soccer League, the United Soccer League, was initially geographically based in the coastal southeast around clubs in Charleston, Richmond, Charlotte, Wilmington, Raleigh, Virginia Beach, and Atlanta. 
Topic: <laughs> Health. Nine southern states have obesity rates exceeding 30% of the population, the highest in the country, Mississippi, Louisiana, West Virginia, Alabama, Oklahoma, Arkansas, South Carolina, Kentucky, and Texas. Rates for hypertension and diabetes for these states are also the highest in the nation. A study reported that six southern states have the worst incidence of sleep disturbances in the nation, attributing the disturbances to high rates of obesity and smoking. The South has a higher percentage of obese people and diabetics. It has the largest number of people dying from stroke, and the highest rates of cognitive decline. Life expectancy is lower and death rates are higher in the South than in other regions of the United States for all racial groups. This disparity reflects substantial divergence between the South and other regions since the middle of the 20th century. The East South Central Census Division of the United States, made up of Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Alabama, had the highest rate of inpatient hospital stays in 2012. The other divisions, West South Central Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and South Atlantic West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, ranked 7th and 5th respectively. The South had a significantly higher rate of hospital discharges in 2005 than other regions of the United States, but the rate had declined to be closer to the overall national rate by 2011. For cancer in a region, the South, particularly an axis from West Virginia through Texas, leads the nation in adult obesity, adult smoking, low exercise, low fruit consumption, low vegetable consumption, all known cancer risk factors, which matches a similar high-risk axis in all cancers combined, death rates by state, 2011, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Politics. In the first decades after Reconstruction, when white Democrats regained power in the state legislatures, they began to make voter registration more complicated, to reduce black voting. With a combination of intimidation, fraud and violence by paramilitary groups, they suppressed black voting and turned Republicans out of office. From 1890 to 1908, 10 of 11 states ratified new constitutions or amendments that effectively disenfranchised most black voters and many poor white voters. This disfranchisement persisted for six decades into the 20th century, depriving blacks and poor whites of all political representation. Because they could not vote, they could not sit on juries. They had no one to represent their interests, resulting in state legislatures consistently underfunding programs and services, such as schools, for blacks and poor whites. With the collapse of the Republican Party in nearly all parts of the South, the region became known as the Solid South, and the Democratic Party after 1900 moved to a system of primaries to select their candidates. Victory in a primary was tantamount to election. From the late 1870s to the 1960s, only rarely was a state or national Southern politician a Republican, apart from a few Appalachian Mountain districts. Republicans, however, continued to control parts of the Appalachian Mountains and compete for power in the border states. Apart from a few states such as the Bird Machine in Virginia, the Crump Machine in Memphis, and a few other local organizations, the Democratic Party itself was very lightly organized. It managed primaries but party officials had little other role. To be successful a politician built his own network of friends, neighbors and allies. Re-election was the norm, and the result from 1910 to the late 20th century was that Southern Democrats in Congress had accumulated seniority, and automatically took the chairmanships of all committees. By the 1940s the Supreme Court began to find disfranchisement measures like the Grandfather Clause and the White Primary unconstitutional. Southern legislatures quickly passed other measures to keep blacks disfranchised, even after suffrage was extended more widely to poor whites. Because white Democrats controlled all the Southern seats in Congress they had outsized power in Congress and could sidetrack or filibuster efforts by Northerners to pass legislation against lynching, for example. Increasing support for civil rights legislation by the National Democratic Party beginning in 1948 caused segregationist Southern Democrats to nominate Strom Thurmond on a third-party ticket in 1948. These Dixiecrats returned to the party by 1950, but Southern Democrats held off Republican inroads in the suburbs by arguing that only they could defend the region from the onslaught of Northern liberals and the civil rights movement. In response to the Brown v. 
Board of Education Ruling of 1954, 101 Southern Congressmen 19 Senators, 82 House members of which 99 were Southern Democrats and two were Republicans in 1956 denounced the Brown decisions as a clear abuse of judicial power that climaxes a trend in the federal judiciary undertaking to legislate in derogation of the authority of Congress and to encroach upon the reserved rights of the states and the people." The manifesto lauded. Those states which have declared the intention to resist enforced integration by any lawful means. It was signed by all Southern Senators except Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson, and Tennessee Senators Albert Gore Sr. and Estes Kefauver. Virginia closed schools in Warren County, Prince Edward County, Charlottesville, and Norfolk rather than integrate, but no other state followed suit. Democratic Governors Orville Faubus of Arkansas, Ross Barnett of Mississippi, John Connolly of Texas, Lester Maddox of Georgia, and, especially, George Wallace of Alabama resisted integration and appealed to a rural and blue-collar electorate. The Northern Democrats' support of civil rights issues culminated when Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which ended legal segregation and provided federal enforcement of voting rights for blacks. In the presidential election of 1964, Barry Goldwater's only electoral victories outside his home state of Arizona were in the states of the Deep South where few blacks could vote before the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Pockets of resistance to integration in public places broke out in violence during the 1960s by the shadowy Ku Klux Klan, which caused a backlash among moderates. Major resistance to school busing extending into the 1970s, national Republicans such as Richard Nixon began to develop their Southern strategy to attract conservative white Southerners, especially the middle class and suburban voters, in addition to migrants from the North and traditional GOP pockets in Appalachia. The transition to a Republican stronghold in the South took decades. First, the states started voting Republican in presidential elections, except for native sons Jimmy Carter in 1976 and Bill Clinton in 1992 and 1996. Then the states began electing Republican senators and finally governors. Georgia was the last state to do so, with Sonny Perdue taking the governorship in 2002. In addition to its middle class and business base, Republicans cultivated the religious right and attracted strong majorities from the evangelical or fundamentalist vote, mostly Southern Baptists, which had not been a distinct political force prior to 1980. After the 2012 elections, the 11 states of the former Confederacy were represented by 98 Republicans, 40 Democrats. Topic: <laughs> Presidents from the South. The South produced nine of the first twelve presidents prior to the Civil War. For more than a century after the Civil War, no politician from an antebellum slave state became president unless he either moved north like Woodrow Wilson or was vice president when the president died in office like Andrew Johnson, Harry Truman and Lyndon B. Johnson. In 1976, Jimmy Carter defied this trend and became the first Southerner to break the pattern since Zachary Taylor in 1848. The South has produced five of the last nine American presidents, Lyndon B. Johnson 1963-69, Jimmy Carter 1977-81, George H. W. Bush 1989-93, Bill Clinton 1993-2001, and George W. Bush 2001-2009. Johnson was a native of Texas, while Carter is from Georgia, and Clinton from Arkansas. While George H. W. Bush and George W. Bush began their political careers in Texas, they were both born in New England and have their ancestral roots in the region. Other politicians and political movements The South has produced various nationally known politicians and political movements. In 1948, a group of Democratic congressmen, led by Governor Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, split from the Democrats in reaction to an anti-segregation speech given by Minneapolis Mayor and future Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. They founded the state's rights Democratic or Dixiecrat Party. During that year's presidential election, the party ran Thurmond as its candidate and he carried four Deep South states. In the 1968 presidential election, Alabama Governor George C. Wallace ran for president on the American Independent Party ticket. Wallace ran a «law and order» campaign similar to that of Republican candidate, Richard Nixon. 
Nixon's Southern strategy of gaining electoral votes downplayed race issues and focused on culturally conservative values, such as family issues, patriotism, and cultural issues that appealed to Southern Baptists. In the 1994 mid-term elections, another Southern politician, Newt Gingrich, led the Republican Revolution, ushering in 12 years of GOP control of the House. Gingrich became Speaker of the United States House of Representatives in 1995 and served until his resignation in 1999. Tom DeLay was the most powerful Republican leader in Congress until he was indicted under criminal charges in 2005 and was forced to step aside by Republican rules. Apart from Bob Dole from Kansas 1985 to 96, the recent Republican Senate leaders have been Southerners, Howard Baker 1981 to 1985 of Tennessee, Trent Lott 1996 to 2003 of Mississippi, Bill Frist 2003 to 2006 of Tennessee, and Mitch McConnell 2007 present of Kentucky. The Republicans' candidates for president have won the South in elections since 1972, except for 1976. The region is not, however, entirely monolithic, and every successful Democratic candidate since 1976 has claimed at least three southern states. Barack Obama won Florida, Maryland, Delaware, North Carolina, and Virginia in 2008 but did not repeat his victory in North Carolina during his 2012 re-election campaign. Topic. Race relations Topic. Native Americans Native Americans had lived in the South for nearly 12,000 years. They were defeated by settlers in a series of wars ending in the War of 1812 and the Seminole Wars, and most were removed west to Indian Territory now Oklahoma and Kansas, but large numbers of Native Americans managed to stay behind by blending into the surrounding society. This was especially true of the wives of Euro-American merchants and miners. Topic. Civil rights The South witnessed two major events in the lives of 20th-century African Americans, the Great Migration and the American Civil Rights Movement. The Great Migration began during World War I, hitting its high point during World War II. During this migration, blacks left the South to find work in northern factories and other sectors of the economy. The migration also empowered the growing civil rights movement. While the movement existed in all parts of the United States, its focus was against disfranchisement and the Jim Crow laws in the South. Most of the major events in the movement occurred in the South, including the Montgomery bus boycott, the Mississippi Freedom Summer, the March on Selma, Alabama, and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. In addition, some of the most important writings to come out of the movement were written in the South, such as King's Letter from Birmingham Jail. Most of the civil rights landmarks can be found around the South. The Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument in Birmingham includes the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute which details Birmingham's role as the epicenter of the civil rights movement. The 16th Street Baptist Church served as a rallying point for coordinating and carrying out the Birmingham campaign as well as the adjacent Kelly Ingram Park that served as ground zero for the infamous children's protest that eventually led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 has been rededicated as a place of revolution and reconciliation and is now the setting of moving sculptures related to the battle for civil rights in the city. Both are centerpieces of the Birmingham Civil Rights District. The Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site in Atlanta includes a museum that chronicles the American civil rights movement as well as Martin Luther King Jr.'s boyhood home on Auburn Avenue. Additionally, Ebenezer Baptist Church is located in the Sweet Auburn District as is the King Center, location of Martin Luther and Coretta Scott King's grave sites. The civil rights movement ended Jim Crow laws across the South. A second migration appears to be underway, with African Americans from the North moving to the South in record numbers. While race relations are still a contentious issue in the South, the region surpasses the rest of the country in many areas of integration and racial equality. According to 2003 report by researchers at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, Virginia Beach, Charlotte, Nashville-Davidson, and Jacksonville were the five most integrated of the nation's 50 largest cities, with Memphis at number six. Southern states tend to have a low disparity in incarceration rates between blacks and whites relative to the rest of the country. Symbolism 
Some Southerners use the Confederate flag to identify themselves with the South, states' rights and Southern tradition. Groups, such as the League of the South, have a high regard for the secession movement of 1860, citing a desire to protect and defend Southern heritage. Numerous political battles have erupted over flying the Confederate flag over state capitals, and the naming of public buildings or highways after Confederate leaders, the prominence of certain statues, and the everyday display of Confederate insignia. Other symbols of the South include the Bonnie Blue flag, magnolia trees, and the song, Dixie. Major cities The South was heavily rural as late as the 1940s, but now the population is increasingly concentrated in metropolitan areas. The following tables show the 20 largest cities, metropolitan, and combined statistical areas in the South. Houston is the largest city in the South. Major metropolitan areas Asterisk asterisk indicates part of the metropolitan area is outside the states classified as southern. Topic: Major combined statistical areas. Topic: See also. Topic: References. Ayers, Edward L. What caused the Civil War? Reflections on the South and Southern History, 2005. Cash, Wilbur J. The Mind of the South, 1941. Cooper, Christopher A. and H. Gibbs Knotts, eds. The New Politics of North Carolina, U. of North Carolina Press, 2008. ISBN 978-0-8078-5876-9. Flint, J. Wayne Dixie's Forgotten People, The South's Poor Whites, 1979. Deals with 20th century. David M. Katzman. Black Migration. The Reader's Companion to American History. Houghton Mifflin Company. James Grossman. 1996. Chicago and the Great Migration. Illinois History Teacher. 3. 2. Archived from the original on September 3, 2006. McQuinney, Grady. In Cracker Culture Celtic Ways in the Old South. 1988. John O. Allen and Clayton E. Jewett 2004. Slavery in the South, A State-by-State -State History. Greenwood Press. ISBN 0-313-32019-5. Rayford Logan 1997. The Betrayal of the Negro from Rutherford B. Hayes to Woodrow Wilson. New York, Da Capo Press. ISBN 0-306-80758-0. A History of the South, 1607-1936. Prentice Hall. Mark, Rebecca, and Rob Vaughn. The South, The Greenwood Encyclopedia of American Regional Cultures, 2004. Robert W. Twyman, and David C. Roller, ed., ed., 1979. Encyclopedia of Southern History. LSU Press. ISBN 0-8071-0575-9, CS1 maint, Extra Text, Editor's List link. Charles Reagan Wilson and William Ferris, ed., ed., 1989. Encyclopedia of Southern Culture. University of North Carolina Press. ISBN 0-8078-1823-2, CS1 maint, Extra Text, Editor's List link. Topic. Further reading Edward L. Ayers The Promise of the New South, Life After Reconstruction. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-508548-5. Monroe Lee Billington The Political South in the Twentieth Century. Scribner. ISBN 0-684-13983-9. Earl Black and Merle Black 2002. The Rise of Southern Republicans. Belknap Press. ISBN 0-674-01248-8. W. J. Cash 1935. The Mind of the South. New York, Vintage Books. ISBN 0-679-73647-6. Pete Daniel 2000. Lost Revolutions – The South in the 1950s. University of North Carolina Press. 
ISBN 0 8078 4848 4. Davis, Donald, and Mark R. Stoll. Southern United States An Environmental History. 2006. Edwards, Laura F. Southern History as U.S. History. Journal of Southern History, 75, August 2009, 533-64. Fredrickson, Carey, 2013. Cold War Dixie, Militarization and Modernization in the American South. Athens, Georgia, University of Georgia Press. Michael Kraling, 1998. Inventing Southern Literature. University Press of Mississippi. p. 66. ISBN 1-57806-045-1. Heather A. Haveman 2004. Antebellum Literary Culture and the Evolution of American Magazines. Poetics, 32-5-28. doi, 10.1016, j, poetic.2003.12.002. Eugene D. Genovese Roll, Jordan, Roll, The World the Slaves Made. New York, Vintage Books. p. 41. ISBN 0-394-71652-3. Morris, Christopher 2009. A More Southern Environmental History. Journal of Southern History. 75 581-598. Howard N. Rabinowitz September 1976. From Exclusion to Segregation, Southern Race Relations, 1865-1890. Journal of American History. 43-325-350. Nichols C. Ray 1994. Southern Democrats. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-508709-7. Jeffrey A. Raffel 1998. Historical Dictionary of School Segregation and Desegregation, The American Experience. Greenwood Press. ISBN 0-313-29502-6. J. Mills Thornton III. Archipelagos of My South, Episodes in the Shaping of a Region, 1830-1965 online. Verts, Nancy 2006. Change in the Plantation System, American South, 1910-1945. Explorations in Economic History. 43 1, 153-176. doi, 10.1016, j.eeh.2005.04.003. Wells, Jonathan Daniel 2009. The Southern Middle Class. Journal of Southern History. 75 3, 651. C. Van Woodward 1955. The Strange Career of Jim Crow. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-514690-5. Gavin Wright 1996. Old South, New South, Revolutions in the Southern Economy Since the Civil War. LSU Press. ISBN 0-8071-2098-7. External links Southern United States Travel Guide from Wikivoyage Doc South, documenting the American South, multimedia collections from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Center for the Study of Southern Culture, the research center at the University of Mississippi, with a graduate program and undergraduate major in Southern Studies University of Mississippi Libraries, Southern Studies, Library Guides University of North Carolina, Southern Studies, Southern Studies Jumpgate Annotated list of sites